morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Okay, I'm an educator. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. One more time, you can do a little better. Happy Sabbath. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. We are so glad to have each and every one of you here today. Hasn't it been a wonderful week? Amen. Amen. And it is so wonderful to finish off the week with the Sabbath and be able to come together. We're just going to start off our program this morning with a word of prayer. Can I invite each of you to stand and join us if you are able? And we're just going to invite the Lord into our prayer. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for another Sabbath day that we could join together in this place. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit be with us this morning. Fill every heart. Fill this building. And may make yourself known to each and every one of us. Bless this program this morning and through the divine service. May we learn something and share that with those around us. Draw us close to you. In your name we pray, amen. We're just gonna start off with a song service this morning. Just wanna let you know who we have up here. My name is Gail Wilton and I'm the Education Director for the Alberta Conference. And I'm Brent Van Rensburg and I'm the Associate Director of Education for the Alberta Conference. And behind us, we have all of our administrators. So we're so glad to have them all here with us. <laughs> How many of you are happy to be here this morning? Happy Sabbath? How many of you had mountains to climb? How many of you have been through the valleys? Maybe of the shadows of death in some cases. How many of you have had trials that God has seen you through? And sometimes he had to give you a push. And like Pastor Middle said last night, sometimes he just holds you. Right? But these are all reasons that we can have sunshine in our soul today. And that's one of the first songs we'll be singing this morning. There's sunshine in my soul today. So please sing with us. Let's sing. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than flows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, Smiling. 
just sang with sunshine in the soul, but we also said with a smiling face. Let me see some smiling faces this morning. Are you happy to be here? Smiling faces. Look to your neighbor to your right and to your left and says, say to them, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And remember to say this, God loves me. God loves me. And all the wonder of it all. George Beverly Shane. All the wonder of it all. Let's sing that nice and loud and clear. Let us stand. This is our opening song this morning. Let us stand. All the wonder of it all. I'm Stephen Gabries, and I'm the principal at College Heights Christian School in Lacombe, a fabulous place, place to be and an amazing school for sure in our conference. Part of a principal council that's just amazing to work with. I am privileged and blessed to be working amongst such amazing administrators, and we are here just to just show you and, and share a snippet and a, just a beautiful thing that's happening in our conference in our schools. At College Heights, if you haven't been there recently, uh, you definitely need to come, to come to one of the potlucks or come to one of the, the places that brings you to our gymnasium because you will find, if you've been there a long time ago or even just a year ago, it's a lot different now. There is no more carpet in our gym. We are excited about a brand new project that we just completed. And $200,000 later, we got new chairs, tables, a new surface, a new center court for basketball, incredible improvements, a brand new classroom, really, for a new teacher that we've even implemented, a new, a new PE teacher and athletic director. Our school is growing. We've grown from 150 students two years ago to now 
230 students are registered for next school year. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. But we're just here just to share again of that beautiful journey and energy of all those kids in our school that happened last March, March 8th. We had an amazing event that culminated through a fundraiser. We participate as a school in a mathletics competition across the world. And one thing that we were doing with this is that we had the 3P Learning, the mathletics actual company, had, had invited me to down to a conference. And through that connection, they wanted to visit one of the schools and they chose our school. And I was just blessed and amazed thinking about that and dreaming up what we should do when we have the actual 3P Learning Company team with their swag and their energy and their videography team. Why would they even pick us? So we decided as a school to turn that event, that math competition event, into a fundraiser for the school in Kenya that PAA was sending a mission trip to. And it was an incredible partnership. Long story short, these kids were challenged to have goals, they sent and found pledges, and they were actually putting in the, the time and effort to learn their math so that they could contribute their math scores would attribute a higher participation of the funds that would go towards the school. These kids took it to heart, and on that, that day when they arrived at school, they were some of them were nervous coming up to me, but Mr. Gabers, I'm nervous because they wanted to do as best that they could for the most dollars for those schools and in the end, with the team there and the whole celebration, we ended up raising um, $9,240 towards the school in Africa, which was incredible. The community at Lacombe was so supportive of that. And the kids' performance in this math competition blew me away. There was uh, each, each grade level, from kindergarten all the way to grade nine, all had their categories. And across Canada, there was not one class in our school that was lower than third in Canada. We had about three classes that were first in Canada. And the top class that we had was actually 43rd best class in the world. The scores of these kids were just skyrocketing. Their efforts were coupled with an extra $5,000 from this 3P Learning Mathletics company who has a give back uh, contributions. So together we've combined for a $14,220 which went to uh, Kiami, Kiami School in Kenya. The PAA students on their mission trip went there to see the new desks that, that we built and we had enough for water treatment and even a new classroom from another school and so we are blessed at CHCS for such joy and energy. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that, uh, that bit of information about uh, CHCS. My name is Michael Willing. I'm the uh, principal at uh, Mamaway Atoskatan Native School. And uh, like Steve, we've had some improvements at Mamaway this year. If, uh, if you've been out to campus you'll, um, in the last five or six years, you'll notice that we had built new buildings on the, the south end of the campus, a uh, brand new junior, senior high, and a shop. And uh, the space in between our buildings languished for a few years. Uh, we had some weeds, uh, notably two modular weeds that needed to be moved to Saskatchewan. So we, we got them moved off campus this year. Uh, we got a local company to come out and to clear a field, and we installed an athletic field this year, which is amazing. We have a, a, a baseball backstop that was put in, um, and uh, we have some good partnerships growing with Softball Alberta this year. We had some local representatives out. They were uh, amazed that we could put together such a facility, and they're excited to offer us a camp this fall. So we're excited about the, the opportunities, uh, sports-related opportunities that we have. But I'd also like to just share just a quick story about some of the community involvement. Now, you guys will know that Mamma Way was started by Adventists. We, we created the school as a service project, as a mission to the people of Muscogee. And um, it's, it was always amazing through the years to, to work with our open houses. Now, our open house is generally a time where we would invite Adventists, uh, from across the province to come and participate in the service opportunities that Mamoy had. We would showcase our students uh, to our Adventist community and we would, uh, we would just show who Mamoy was and it was a great opportunity. Um, this year we put the invite out as we did before. Now granted this was the first open house we'd had since COVID and so we weren't sure what the, uh, the Adventist crew would, would bring in. So we put our, our, our bulletins out. Uh, bulletin information and got it out to the conference. We also put out community uh, news snippets um, on local radio and on local Facebook pages inviting the community out. Uh, when we had open house, we had planned an amazing set. We had 
Uh, the theme was game on, so we had a volleyball game. We had uh, the Howler Hut, which sold merchandise and candy and all sorts of confections. And uh, we had uh, an amazing dance performance put on by our Native Culture Studies class, Janice Clark. It was interesting because when I looked into the crowd, I think I saw 10 Adventists, but it was a full house. So the local community had come out in droves. We had well over 200 spectators from the community. We had uh, parents, aunties, uncles, Muslims, Gukums, grandfathers, grandparents. We had local chief Vernon Saddleback there uh, watching his granddaughter perform in our dance group. And it was amazing to see the community involvement in our school. So while Adventists were not there, they will be next year, right? <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah, because you were welcome too. The local community was there, and it was amazing to see. So, thank you. So, for those of you who came in a little later, my name is Gail Wilton, and I am the Education Superintendent here for the Alberta Conference, Director of Education. Uh, I was here on Tuesday night, and I shared a little story. And I know you weren't all here, so I'm going to quickly share it again. And I promised you an update this morning. So on Tuesday afternoon, uh, one of the principals and I were sitting at the education hub that way. <laughs> and we had two little boys come running across the field so excited. And they said, we just did a fundraiser. We sold our candy and we want to donate our money to Adventist education. These two little boys were maybe grade two, lower elementary anyway. So this little boy, who goes to one of our small Adventist schools, stretches out his hand and just opens his hand to reveal two little quarters. That was everything they made. He didn't keep anything back. He gave everything they made. Two little quarters. We were just so filled. We were so filled that these little boys, at such a young age, want to be involved in supporting Adventist education. Very quickly, somebody said, I'll match that, and they added a loony. Somebody else added some more, a $5 bill here, a $20 bill here. And then somebody said, as soon as you get to 25, let me know, and I'll match it. And they did. Somebody else said, when you get to $50, let me know, and I'll match it. And they did. And somebody else said, when you get to 200, then I will match it. And they did. And I want to thank each of you who have come by or caught one of us along the front walkway and have supported. But you know, as the week went on, I stopped counting. But people kept asking, how much have you raised? And I said, well, if you want to know, I'll count it for you. But if I count it, you have to match it. <laughs> Would you like me to count it this morning? <laughs> I know some of you would love to match it. Well, somebody did take me up on that offer, and I counted it, and they matched it. Then I came this morning, and I spoke with somebody else, and he asked how much we had and matched it. So I want to share with you that you still have an opportunity. You can match it, you can exceed it, or you can give whatever the Lord impresses you to support Adventist education, and specifically the work of our young people. As you heard Pastor Potts the other night talk about the statistics with how we are losing our Adventist young people, we have an opportunity to work together with you, with our pastors, with our schools to help bring these young children, these youth to Christ. Remember, Adventist education is not just about math. It's not just about science. It's not just about a Bible class. We are educating for eternity. What are we doing? We will walk our children home, help us walk each other home. I will tell you the total that we have this morning is $4,200. If you would still like to support, yes, somebody say amen. 
If you would still like to support, there is a place on your tithe envelope that you can support at any time, but there is a little blank there, and you can support the 50 Cent School Challenge, and you can just slip that in your tithe envelope if you'd like to be a part of that, or you can come see us at a later date. That would be wonderful. But praise God, let's continue to encourage our young children as we bring them closer to the kingdom. The process of growth is often slow, gradual, unseen. Like a seed that transforms into a mighty tree, the growth of our children marks the passing of time. They begin so small, tiny fingers, little footsteps, one word at a time. As parents, we make time to delight in the small moments. We hold their little hand, we listen closely, and we choose to be present because we know that it's the small, incremental moments that build character. Like the seed that begins small, children walk into our Adventist early childhood programs and schools with fresh smiles, open hearts, and a longing for learning year after year. From the first day of school, when a tear might be shed along with a smile, the years tick by. We see those fresh faces change and grow to become capable adults and new leaders in our midst. Along the way, we dream and pray about the plans God has for each child, plans to prosper them and not to harm them, plans to give them hope and a future. It's true that Adventist education offers academic excellence and innovative teaching and learning methodologies, but Unlike other private and public schools, it layers all learning with a distinct, biblical, Adventist worldview. Our students discover and explore ideas with wonder and questioning, with the Bible at the center. But alongside this, something else is in focus. We're told that character building is the most important work ever entrusted to human beings and never before was its diligent study so important as now. Never was any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before were young men and young women confronted by perils so great as confront them today. The most important work for these times we live in, this is a serious calling indeed. Research has shown that the greatest success in developing character is through a three-way partnership with parents, the church, and the school. It's here when biblical worldviews align that God can do the miracle of shaping children's lives for his purpose and his glory. While Adventist schools do have excellent curricula, it's the teachers who are the living curriculum. They live and breathe their own walk with Jesus and ultimately teach from the overflow of their time with him. Some say that genuine spirituality must be caught, not taught. And this is ever true with character development. It's the teachers who regularly and candidly live and speak about their love for Jesus, who inspire students the most. And when children see genuine spirituality modeled by three significant adults in their lives, they're much more likely to grow in authentic love for Jesus themselves. Teachers in Adventist schools often become one of those significant adults. But the years tick by, and those little seeds do grow quickly. Adventist education loves to partner with parents in these seasons of growth to provide an environment where roots grow downward in God, the giver of life. Growing downward, taking root takes intentional planning, careful nurture, and learning to thrive in both sunshine and rain. Once the roots are established and strong, each tree grows upward toward the sky. Its fruit is a testimony of God's goodness and what he has done. Yes, Adventist education is a partnership with home and church, but most of all, it's a partnership with God in the most important work on earth. 
the growth of his children's characters, the only aspect of this life that will endure forever. It's only as his children take root downward in an abiding relationship with him that they can bear fruit upward and be a witness to the world. Take root downward and bear fruit upward. Happy Sabbath. It's time for our Sabbath school offering. And you may ask, why are we doing a Sabbath school offering at camp meeting? Well, we're part of a work that's much bigger than Alberta and the Northwest Territories. We are part of a worldwide work. And what's interesting uh, that you may not be aware of is this, that the Alberta Conference is one of the highest giving Sabbath school uh, conferences across North America and the Bible says give and it shall be given unto you the Sabbath school has returned for projects that we have done here in Alberta since I've been treasurer over six hundred thousand dollars and so I, I thank you for your giving and that uh, you're willing to be part of a much larger uh, picture than just here in Alberta and the Northwest Territory. So uh, ask the ushers to come forward. Just, Lord, we thank you for your blessing upon the Alberta Conference. And Lord, we thank you so much for the generosity of our members and people who attend that uh, they support your worldwide work for we are to go to the whole world uh, to preach the gospel lord we ask you to bless this offering in your name amen You know, that, as a pastor, that's one of my favorite things to say. Um, and I, I realize that there's many church families here, but we are all one in Christ. Amen? I have with me this morning a panel of uh, really wonderful people. And I'm excited to have a discussion on the Sabbath school lesson this morning. Um, why don't we begin with a short prayer? Father God, I, I praise you for the Sabbath day, God. I praise you that you are here in this place with us and ask that you continue to be with us, to guide, to lead our discussion, Father, that we may grow closer to you moment by moment. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So this uh, week's lesson is entitled, How God Rescues Us. Uh, but before we dive in, I would love for my uh, colleagues here to introduce themselves. Let's start from uh, that end and come this way. Go ahead and share your name, and then if you're an educator, to go ahead and share you know, where, where you're educating your work. Good morning and happy Sabbath all. My name is Danny Desjardins, and I am principal at Parkview Adventist Academy. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here this morning with, with this panel. My name is Nadine Sebetlela. I am a fourth year, going into my fourth year of education at Berman University, uh, studying to be a high school social studies teacher. <laughs> uh, my name is Joshua Boyko. I, I'm here today to represent the average everyday person, apparently. <laughs> I'm not an educator, so see how it goes. <laughs> It is great that in the Adventist Church we can have diversity of thought and diversity of people too, right? So we welcome you. 
Um, and I'm Melissa Cook. I'm the new uh, Vice President of Administration or Executive Secretary. That's the title I'm mostly used, used to. Um, and I hope that you will join with us as we study how God rescues us. Now I wonder, uh, panel, if one of you has a rescue story you'd like to share as we begin this discussion this morning and see what we can pull from that story um, and how that relates to how God rescues us. Yeah, so uh, just quickly, um, Pathfinder, Alberta Pathfinder Campery in the mountains of Western Alberta, grade kind of five, six boys. Um, they were clearly told, do not go up the cliff on your own. Um, it eventually got dark, which they thought was a great time to go up the cliff. Um, going pretty well, climbing up the cliff, everything was going fine. Um, one of the young men got stranded about 45 feet up. So not super high, but high enough that if he falls, it's going to hurt. Um, and then obviously the first reaction is we need to try to get him down, um, obviously by ourselves and uh, certainly tell no one. And uh, in the meantime, they had discovered all the boys were missing and were looking for us. Um, terrified kid on the side of the mountain, couldn't go up, couldn't go down. People are kind of like yelling directions and trying to figure out what we're gonna do and how people can. And the interesting part was what got him down was not more technical knowledge or um, more equipment or more resources. What talked him down was one person giving direction, but really slowly and quietly. So the, like where it talks about a still small voice, a quiet voice that walked him down bit by bit. Um, and certainly he didn't deserve a rescue. He hadn't earned a rescue, <laughs> probably to the contrary. Um, yet the rescue came and it came um, with patience and, and gentleness and a, a still small voice. And that's always, that's always stuck with me my whole life. Oh, wow, that definitely mirrors how God rescues us. Um, and, and it's, how old were you when that happened? Uh, we would have been, yeah, probably 12 years old. Wow. I, I wonder the perspective from a 12 year old being rescued to someone who's adult, right? And I think about the journey each of us take as we, um, get to know Christ and, and realize that we're in need of saving. Um, that's, that's quite different, right? God, God approaches us in a different way. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, our lesson talks about how God rescues us, and it shares a, a story there, I'm sure you read it, um, that was quite gripping, um, but uh, the, the bottom line is, friends, that God, God's efforts is to redeem us, to reach out to us, and sometimes there's a lot of noise, right? A lot of people, um, people maybe experience this saying, hey, this is how you should be rescued, or maybe this is how you can achieve salvation, or this is how you know, you'll be maybe good enough. Um, but the answer is in, as you said, uh, God's direction and how he reaches out to us. Um, let's continue. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, our text is Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. And as we read that in scripture, it gives us a contrast. Paul shares a contrast of past and present. You were, and now you are. Uh, we were dead, deceived, and deluded by both external and internal forces. And the author shares, I'm going to read that quote, that we are bearers of God's image, and yet there's something awry in us. Now, that sometimes can feel a little bit uncomfortable, can't it? To be like, there's, there's something awry in us. But what does that teach us about the great controversy? Um, and panel, if you, you know, if I phrase a question and you think, you know what, I'd like to phrase that differently, feel free to jump in um, as we discuss. I guess for me, it shows the contrast between God's original plan for humanity and uh, how uh, our fallen and broken nature is because of our choices and our disconnection um, to him. So it's nothing that he's done, but it's what we've done. And so we've separated ourselves from him. And so he's there, like you've mentioned, he's there to redeem us and to look at that, 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 that hope, that message is for each and every single one of us. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. 
Um, sometimes, uh, when we talk about the great controversy, however, um, there can be like a lingering undertone of fear, you know? And I remember as a child thinking, Lord, please let me die before persecution because I just, I, I don't think I can bear it, you know? Um, and as we teach, you know, we're talking about teaching, as we teach our children about this great controversy, our young people about what's happening and, and the end times, friends, how can we balance the fear of this end times with the actual hope that we have in Jesus? God says, I'm not a God of fear, right? How do we balance that comfort in, in the way we understand it, but also how we teach our children and our young people? Yeah, I, I can't speak for everyone. I know for my children, when that question comes up, is what are we going to do? How would I do with that? I don't think I would do well having my fingernails pulled out or whatever, right? Which is, you know, fair point. I'm a bit of a coward. I wouldn't have done it either. Um, but the question is always, are you, are you planning to do it all on your own? In which case, yeah, you're, you're right. You probably can't make it through. But the great, if you start created in the image, and then the end of the book is you redeemed into the image, then the, the middle just becomes the, the journey of trying to stay connected to how you started it and how you finish. Point. Anyone else? Yeah, sure. I was going to add it particularly about the children. Um, this, and it feels really heavy with parenting, right? Because you're trying to model that. So if you're already in a position of fear or you are struggling with that, um, that's what's going to translate to your kids. And um, the journey of releasing that fear is grounded in the word. And this has been a process, right? Because the way that I understand the promises of God when I was 12 is not how I understand them today because of all the experience, right? And our children don't have that experience yet. So they're relying, and not just on me as a parent, but on the village, right? So this whole building, every one of us, right? Our kids are watching us, and, and we don't have it perfect, right? But that's not even really the point. The point is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it's that the fruit of the Spirit is what's going to, like Josh is saying, pull us through and carry us through those times. But if we haven't, it's like the Ten Virgins, right? Yeah. If you didn't have it when things were calm or relatively or not as bad, where are you going to find it in the, that 11th hour? What are we leaning into? Are we le leaning into fear? Are we leaning into a love? And, um, you know, God, God's... God wants a relationship with us, and so he, that starts now. And so we build that relationship and that trust forms through the building of that relationship, and we realize through our journey that s fear does not stem from God. It does not begin there. Yeah. And so we can let it go because he is not fear. So where are we leaning? Are we leaning into fear or are we leaning into his love? Yeah, excellent points. Thank you all so much for sharing. I, I love that we can have discussions and uh, we're on a journey, right, with, with Christ. It's not a, we've made it. It's a, let's keep growing. Let's keep growing in our understanding. And as we grow, we can teach those under our care. Uh, we can model that um, and lean in, like you said, uh, into Jesus. Um, let's continue in Tuesday's lesson. Um, the author shares that we are co-exalted with Jesus. We are co-resurrected, co-raised, and co-seated. So how, how and, I, and I love to move this practically, okay, because I think that it's important for us to understand theology, absolutely. But how does that inform who we are? how we behave, and then how we pass that on to the next generation. So what does this mean? What do these three co's mean? And how would we understand that, again, practically? Um, so this year's theme is, but, my, my, but by my spirit says the Lord. What comes before that? What, in that text? Not by might, nor by power. Nor by power. And just like yesterday, last night's message, there's nothing that we can do. None of it comes from us. We need to lean into the Spirit. The Spirit will get us through. 
And so then we become, by the Spirit indwelling in us, we become filled by the Spirit, we become co-laborers with the Spirit, we become co-seated with the Spirit, uh, co-exalted, co-resurrected, because He has done, and for what He has given us in the gift of salvation, it's nothing that we have done. Uh, we are alive together in Christ. What does that mean? It's to having that relationship with your maker. And that, is, that was the original plan in mm, Eden. Yeah. That's how Adam and Eve walked around. And that's how he wants to walk around with us today. Yeah, I'm just going to quickly jump in from like the every man perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's easy to know a lot of things and then expect a result. But I don't know if anyone else here, I mean, maybe I'm the only one, who have at times not felt co-resurrected or co-leading or co-authoritarian -co and feel like you're still fall, it's still falling apart. And I think that when that occurs, um, like 2-5 where it talks about even when you're dead to trespasses, but you were made alive together with Christ, the with Christ part, I think, we forget where all of a sudden we're still waiting for it to happen or as if I can do a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think that that is a bit of, a, bit of an issue. It's easy for us to get distracted mm -hmm. and, and not read the part of the verse where it's through, through Christ. So then how do you stay close to that? Mm -hmm. I'll add to that too. Like the work is completed. I think I forget that all the time. Like, the, the battle is finished. I, I really struggle, like in your daily life, right? When you're struggling with, you know, a situation that is out of your control, or, you know, the thing is not stopping, and it's just pummeling, pummeling, and being able to rest, like Daddy's saying, in the, in the completed work of Christ. Like, he's already overcome the fear. He's already overcome the shame. He's already overcome the pain. Uh, and that is a, um, a, a process. And that I think, again, in the collective, uh, do we, what I wonder is if we give each other enough grace when we're working through that, because that is not something that comes overnight for most of us. It's not something that um, just materializes as you, when you're in the crucible, you know what I mean? So um, I think that that's uh, a way that we can gain perspective as a collective, that as we're trying to learn what this means, mm -hmm. learn to, to claim the victory in Christ, that we're all at different points on that pathway, yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Um, I'm gonna read just uh, what the author says here on Tuesday. Christ gains the victory over all evil and spiritual powers, the very ones who dominated the lives of the believers. Um, Christ gains victory. Let, let that settle with you. Christ is victorious. Yes, amen. Can I hear an amen? Yes. Christ is victorious. And just as you're sharing, each of us are on a journey with him. And that journey may be at times sprints, but at times it may just be crawling. Yeah. Um, and I think it, you're right that it's important to have that perspective that we should, we should and can look at each other in love and be like, you know, you're, you're growing and I'm growing too in Christ. We're united with Jesus. So thank you so much for sharing, everybody. Um, let's, let's jump into Wednesday. So God's plan of salvation is not just for the past or the present, where we are now, but the eternal future. And when I read that, that kind of ties in with what you were saying, Nadine, that um, it's, it's not, uh, I've made it, right? It's not a point in history where I'm like, okay, I'm saved and now I'm good, right? And um, that's something that I feel we can communicate maybe better to, to younger generations, right? That it's okay if you, if you trip. It's okay if, if you fall. Because mom does that too. Because pastor does that too. Because, you know, uncle or so-and-so. Um, we are growing. The author in the in Sabbath tool says that grace, and Paul too, is a treasure. And I wonder, do we look at grace as a treasure? Well, well, for me, yeah. I, if you're married and you're a guy, <laughs> exactly. you look at grace as a treasure. Yes, I do. Okay. So, yeah, for sure you do. 
but with that grace, and it's interesting how marriage is connected to in the Bible as, as the, the story and the allegory and the symbol, and then you get married and you're like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it actually is the start of the journey, right? Like we have kids down below that are talking about baptism, right? So for them, that is the start of their public declaration. Yes. Um, it is not the culmination Amen. of anything, Amen. right? You're, you're going to take the, the plunge, literally, yeah. and then you will have to work and claw and figure it out, and, and you will have setbacks, and you will have, you will have all those issues, mm -hmm. and it will be through grace. And in those trials, I think that it's, it's difficult to start to really treasure grace until you have been through the trial mm -hmm. and had it given Good to point. you. Man, I, yeah, I just thought it just hit me real, real hard because that's exact. I've heard that over this week actually. Like you can't give what you don't have, mm. and if you don't receive, and that receiving, I'll tell you, like in my journey, has been incredibly difficult to receive anything really, wow. any help, any admonition, any compliments. Receiving is something that I learned to ignore. Wow. Okay, so when it comes now to receiving an unmerited gift of salvation. That, for some people, is like very difficult. Yeah. Because they don't feel like, don't we know this? We, feel, we know that some people that are in our circles right now do not believe that they deserve to even step foot even in this building. Wow. Because of the things. And so when, again, how am I positioning myself? Have I received the, the love and the forgiveness of Christ, the mercy of Jesus, and as much as I've received it, I may, <laughs> through the power of the Spirit, receive somebody that needs it today. And, and that's, the real, that's the real thing we're dealing with in this mm -hmm. camp meeting setting, in our homes, in our schools. Because, yeah, the, the enemy's not playing. The enemy is not playing with our souls. He is, is determined. And so we have the power and authority in Christ, like we're saying, right? Yeah. All power is given to Christ in heaven and earth. And then we are called to go forth. No? Go ahead. If, yeah. if, uh, if there was no grace, none of us would be here. And so I really resonate with what was shared. And you know, you can only share with what you've received. And understanding, understanding that you are precious to God no matter what. Understanding that promise, understanding that you are loved no matter what. That is grace being unfolded before you. And being able to extend that grace to I'm a high school principal to my students. Yeah. You know, the way that I respond to behavior mm -hmm. is going to set a trajectory for how my students respond, like move forward. So when, as a parent, when I discipline my children, how am I doing that? Am I doing that as a co-parent with Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Because he has modeled it for us through the word, through the examples in the, in the Bible, am I doing that with my children? And I believe that if we are open to receiving the Holy Spirit, he speaks to us in the moments where grace can be extended. Wow. And to follow in that journey, to, to follow in that, that prompting by the Holy Spirit. I remember one time with my son, he was using his hands to hit my daughter. <laughs> it's just a sibling thing. I think you guys all understand. Yes. So I was like, oh, what do I do? Do I go and spank him? Mm. No, because that is exactly what I'm asking him not to do. So the Holy Spirit talked to me right there, and he told me, grab his hands. Mm. So I grabbed his hands, just gently grabbed his hands, and I got down at his level, and I looked him in the eyes. And all I said, and this is like, this is the Holy Spirit working, mm. is all I said is, why did God give us hands? Mm. That was it. Was, is it to do good or to do bad, mm. right? So that my son could understand. Mm. And you know, like I've, I've approached him that way many times because of that intentional grace that I extended, I can say it to my son again. Hey, why did God give us hands? Mm -hmm. And he stops, mm -hmm. right? And it was just a different approach. But because I had, had received grace from God, I'm able to extend that. And that is what God is asking all of us to be doing. Right? Receive the grace. Mm. Know that you are precious and that you are loved. And extend that grace to everyone. Yeah, like, just quickly, Nadine, you had, like, said that even people here feel they don't deserve grace. 
Um, I know that when I read, I'm just going to like quickly, Micah 7, 18, where he talks about who is a God like you, right, pardoning iniquity. Uh, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. Yeah. Right, so, of course, now I just read a verse out of context. So after one day with <laughs> Professor Olive, I feel a little guilty even just doing it, but hopefully she'll have grace. So. <laughs> The truth in the text is there, however, right? Um, so thank you. Thank you all for, sh for sharing. And I, I just, I resonate with, with what uh, you're all sharing. It, it's, it's true. And I want to say that that's um, why I'm still an Adventist. Because when I was going through things in high school, let's say, my uh, uh, dean approached me with grace yeah. when she could have, um, you know, done other. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> you know, as, as I grew, God sent people to approach me with grace, to reflect the love, the grace of God that put me on a path that I could just serve him wholeheartedly regardless. Um, and it, it eventually helped me understand my own value yeah. because I didn't see it. Uh, I wasn't taught it, uh, and I didn't know to receive even um, grace, and so I thank God for that. Um, our own value. Friends, I'd like you for you to reflect on your value this morning. You are valued by God. He loves you. He died for you. And now I want you to stretch your mind and look at the people around you he loves that person beside you. Collectively, we are God's treasure, and he gives us grace as a treasure, not to hoard it, but to share it to the generations before and after us and to ourselves. I loved earlier this week, um, a speaker said, uh, I think it was one of our pastors in our pastor's meeting, he, he said, God believes in you. And that has stuck with me because he does. And even when we're at our lowest, where we can't even lift up our head, God believes in you and loves you and values you. Let's move on to Thursday. Paul emphasizes that it is God who is the main actor in salvation. And oh, I love this part. Um, I want to read a quote. Here we go. Um, on uh, page 35, if you have your lesson with you on Thursday. Instead of being rooted in their own qualities, their salvation is rooted in God's inexplicable love, a love that cannot be explained based on any worth in the object of that love. We're, we're talking about value here, right? It is, our salvation is rooted in God's inexplicable love. Wow. Wow. What are your thoughts, friends, on um, and your reaction of what the author is saying here? I have that song in my head, and can it be has like six verses in the middle. <laughs> You're trying to like get through the whole song, but really, right? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, have, shouldst die for me? You know, when you really are, when you encounter Christ. You know, put away all the things that people teach you and all the things that you learned when you were a kid and all the lies, because there's some things that people were just straight up lying to you about God. And then you were at the foot of the cross and you recognize how undeserved, but how freely given. Yes. That's, that's beautiful, it's exciting, and it's, I wish I could live more in that, to be honest, Melissa. Mm. I wish I could live in that place more often because I feel like that would just transform the people around me. Yes. Like it would transform my home, it would transform my church, it would transform my school with the children that I educate, which if I could just carry that with me. And I think that's what God's inviting us to do, is to can carry that truth with you everywhere you go. And may it overflow Amen. Right, onto the people um, who are in our circle of influence, in our care, and even those who we just uh, approach and walk by casually. Mm -hmm. Now, in Ephesians 2, um, at the very end uh, of, our, of our section, um, Scripture says that we are 
God's masterpiece. Mm. And that's, that's how I understand it. So hopefully I'm understanding it correctly. Feel free to inter interrupt and it, you know, I'm learning. So that's all right if you wanna correct me. But how do we define a masterpiece? Mm. And is the piece, the, the, the piece that's turning into a masterpiece involved in the process? Well, you, usually in a masterpiece, whatever the original start, I'm just thinking of like classic sculptures, whatever the original o object is, ends up losing a whole bunch of itself. Wow. Wow. To, to manifest the mas masterpiece. Mm. Word. Word, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, oof. Yep, yep, that's it. So as God's masterpiece, are we involved in that process? So a masterpiece, like Josh has said, it's not, it's not the original. Once it is a masterpiece, it's changed. And like he said, it's lost a lot of itself. Like a canvas, a blank canvas is nothing. You know, um, we can be our own masters and build our own masterpiece within us. However, when we receive Christ, that white robe or that white canvas is put upon us. Our masterpiece is removed. And his masterpiece begins to take fruition, like the potter and the clay, right? The clay is just sitting there doing nothing. And then the potter forms it and molds it as he needs it. Or he wants. And so I, uh, I went to a trade show and I've always wanted to do pottery. So I talked to the guy for like an hour and a half and he's like, oh, you got to come. You got to join this guild. It'd be so awesome. And then somehow my wife joined the guild and then I stayed with the kids and she did pottery. I don't, I'm not 100% sure what happened. But then I did go and I was watching her throw pottery and I'm like, oh, yeah, this is like the potter and the clay and all the other, you know, like every devotional book you've read. Right. Right until she was like, mm, that's not working and went <gasps> and then started again. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh no, oh. oh, well that does give a different perspective. <laughs> Suddenly, I guess if the potter can decide to do whatever they want with the clay and start again, maybe I shouldn't be quite so unhappy with some of the circumstances I might be in place. If I, if I truly believe that I am the clay and God is the potter versus I'm the clay and the potter. Yeah, yeah. That's good perspective. Uh, does the clay then, Say, no, don't squish me. <laughs> it's right. No, it's, it waits to be revealed in the next iteration. Mm. Right, right. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm stuck on that clay, okay, squishing clay portion. And I think about being fired, yeah. you know, at, at yeah. camp. We, we, we encourage the kids to do it. And then they, we put, them, put the pieces in a kiln. Did I say that right? I, I hope so. And then it gets fired at temperatures that I don't even want to be near. Um, and the end piece uh, is usually glossy, and it I guess it depends on the place, but, and beautiful um, compared to the original when it started. Um, as a masterpiece in God's hands, I don't believe the, the piece knows when the beginning and the end is. Right? So as, as we grow in Christ, as we are molded, as pieces are shaven off, let's say, as maybe we are squished again to, and oof, that just doesn't sound comfortable, um, and, and remolded in, the, in what we go through in life um, and the experiences we have and how we learned, when are we completed? So by beholding Jesus, we are made complete. If we turn to Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So wherever we lack, he fills. Wherever we're, we're missing something, he is the rest. So it's, it's, I, I just wonder, that with that verse, is by beholding him, 
we are made complete. Maybe not the way that you know we will be in the twinkling of an eye. Mm. You know that will be a completed as well, but a right. different complete. But we can be made complete with Him today. Yeah. Yeah. Wow! Thank you for that perspective. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to comment on that? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you teach children, um, they're complete. Like the completest job they do is based on their experience and capabilities, and then it moves as they grow. So suddenly they're like, you, you did a great job and you put your toothbrush on the counter when you were done. That's complete, that's as tall as that kid can reach. But then soon that kid can also shut the water off, they can rinse their toothbrush, they can put it away. The complete, they, while they completed a level, you brought them to a place to complete the level, you didn't finish the work because there's new levels to complete, yeah. like video games. And, like and video games. Can I just hang yeah. into this? Yeah, okay. Just to piggyback, just as that kid puts the toothbrush on the counter, who completes the work? The mom or the dad there, right? And then when they get to that point of turning off the faucet or whatever, and they miss a step, who completes the work? Turning off the light, right? So God is that for us, right, on our journey. That is wonderful. So we can be complete in Christ, as Chris scripture says, um, and yet we could continue being complete if we remain in Christ. Now, Ephesians is, is beautiful, uh, made alive in Christ, even though we are dead. Uh, verse 8, by grace we have been saved through faith and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And we talked briefly about that, him being a treasure. And, and I love the next verse, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Friends, and um, I'm short, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm short. And <laughs> when I uh, played sports in middle school and in high school, I loved to be like, Man, I'm short, but I can still, you know, block you, or I can still, and, and I loved to boast in myself. But this reminds me, yeah, I don't play basketball anymore, um, but anyway, um, that it is not this gift of God, um, this, this growth that we have, um, the salvation we have, the value that I see um, in me is all because of my Savior Jesus. And um, this, this section, I mean, it has so much in it. it, it it's, it's rich with much that we can discuss. Uh, but friends, um, in the end, um, the answer, as my high school, as I like to tell my high school teacher, uh, Mr. Bose, the answer is always Jesus. Even on a physics test, he would still give us a point if I wrote Jesus. So um, remember that, uh, the answer is Jesus. And, and when you can't get up, Jesus. And when you had a good day, Jesus. And as we pray, may your heart, and as we continue, may your heart just sing to our Lord Jesus, who is our all. Um, Danny, can I ask you to close with a short prayer? Sure. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for gathering us this morning together, like-minded individuals, just, Lord, looking for you and looking for a relationship with you. Lord, continue to be our everything. Help us to lean into you and to your love and help us to um, go about things with you as a co-laborer with you, to be filled by your spirit, Lord, before we go and do the work that you have commissioned us to do. Thank you for this conversation, the dialogue that took place this morning. I learned a lot and I'm grateful to be um, here. Thank you for the Sabbath and may we continue to be blessed. In Jesus' name I pray these things, amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us. And thank you, each of you. I've had a great time and I've learned as well.
Amen. Are you not amazed? I am amazed. It gets me emotional. These are our children. We talked about this this morning. These are the children that we are bringing to Christ. Oh, I'm amazed. I feel so blessed. This morning as we end our Sabbath school, I would just like to acknowledge if you have been are currently or are in an education program, if you are a teacher, please stand. If you're a teacher in our Adventist system, please stand. If you are a teacher, an Adventist teacher in our mission field, in our public schools, in our separate schools, in our other private schools, if you are now or ever have been, please stand. We thank you for standing and for your service. Just remain standing just for a couple more minutes if you don't mind, okay? Because the mission field is great. And it takes many people to secure our children. So with that, if you are a pastor, I'm asking you to stand. Because pastors, you too, are so important to our children. You too educate our children for eternity. 
And you can see the teachers and the pastors standing here, and some of them are here, and some of them are still doing their service elsewhere right now as we speak. But the village is also important. And every single one of you here play an integral part to the success of Adventist education. So we want to acknowledge and recognize you too. So you too, please stand. Everyone, that's every one of you. Every single one of you should be standing right now because you are the village. All of you should be standing because we're going to pray over you. Pastor Potts is going to pray over you and pray for God's blessings on you this morning. Pastor Potts. It does take a village to raise a child. Amen. And before I pray with you, I want to share with you one promise, one quotation that has shaped my life. It's found in Desire of Ages, page 250, where it says, There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, by putting self aside, makes room for the work of the Holy Spirit in his life and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. There is no limit to the usefulness of one. My friend, may God show himself mighty in your life throughout this next school year. Our children are precious. And by God's grace, we will help each one of them walk with Jesus and be ready for his coming. Amen. Let me pray with you and for you. Our Father and our God, I thank you today for this village that is standing, representing this Alberta conference. Lord, for the teachers, the educators among us, the pastors, every member in every church, Lord Jesus, we choose today to put self aside and to make room for your spirit to fill us. By your grace, may it truly be said that there was no limit to our usefulness. Lord Jesus, have your way. Bless this group. Bless us each as we serve you, as we work for our children. And by your grace, may not one of them be missing on that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Exactly 50 years ago, something special started in Bowdoin, Alberta. Since then, the Alberta Conference Camp Meeting has touched many lives. And this year, we'd like to go back to how it all began. With the very first theme we had at Foothills Camp. invite you to the 2023 Alberta Conference Camp Meeting. Come join us to celebrate 50 years of moving by His Spirit. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Are you happy to be here this morning? Yes. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. 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 It is so good to see so many thousands of individuals. We have about 10,000 people here. Amen? Amen. That's people <laughs> plus angels. Praise the Lord. We, we want to welcome our online audience from all around the world. God bless you. Welcome to our Foothills Camp meeting, our 50th anniversary. And we are glad to be here today. I don't know, some of you may not know who the host and the hostess are. I am Debbie Schwartz. I work for the President and the Secretary at the Alberta Conference Office. I work for some of the rest of them too on occasion, but that's mainly my job. What do you do? I work as a pastor in Edmonton, pastor in two of the greatest churches in the world, Christ the Way and Abundant Life. <laughs> and we're both glad to be with you and, and helping you move through your day today. What's on the schedule for today? Amen. Well, today we have a pack today. Um, we actually started at about 6 40 this morning and you were there with a blessing from our <laughs> orchestra and um, Sandra and Ted there led us out in an amazing powerful prayer experience we are the principal for um, CHCS blessed us with a powerful devotion and I was blessed I was blessed indeed and every single individual here was blessed we had many individuals here this morning young people middle-aged and our seniors as well it was indeed a blessing 
and we are here now. Well, no, you missed Sabbath school here. You might have been in a division. Well, I was actually at Sabbath school in the trailer ah. because I went back home to get ready and we had Sabbath school in the trailer. I can tell you everything that happened. It was a good Sabbath school. Do you agree? Amen. Yes, it was education day and it was a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath school and the lesson was very, very good. What's happening this afternoon now? So this afternoon, we have individuals who have decided to go all the way with Christ into baptism. We are having baptisms this afternoon, baptisms in the pool, baptisms in the lake, baptisms in the river from 2 to 3 p.m. And also, at 2.45, we have our parade our Pathfinders and Master Guides in the Alberta and Northwest Territories Conference will be on Parade for Jesus. We'll have our drum corps as well. So I, we have a packed afternoon. Also, Debbie, after that, we have something else, right? Well, I know that the, the parade today might not be as big as it usually is, but when I saw the little clip about it, there's 1,500 that could have been here in the parade. So when you see the parade this afternoon, think of how long it would have taken for 1,500. Wow. So, yes, and after that, we have the concert. You know, many years ago, we're talking about our 50 years, they used to have a concert in the park, and it was wonderful, but it changed, and it's now in the auditorium. It's representative representative of the whole conference. So there's groups from everywhere, north, south, east, and west. You won't want to miss the concert at four o'clock. Debbie, may, maybe you and I can have a duet. We could. At a concert. I don't Amen? know if they'd let us now, but so we'll practice I'll next sing year. baritone and you'll sing soprano. Right. Amen. We will do that next year. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. So um, we are so happy um, that we have all gathered here today. Indeed, the Holy Spirit has been falling mightily on this camp. Young people have been committing their hearts to Jesus. Uh, adults, seniors as well. It's been a powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence. And as we come to the close of this year's camp meeting, as our president always says, the best is yet to come. No matter how powerful and mighty the move of God has been in your life, God is always about to do something greater in your experience. Amen? Amen. So at this time, before we hand over to our mass choir, we'll just have a word of prayer as our mass choir leads us into the throne room of God through praise and worship. Let us, let's stand for prayer. Let's stand for prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, indeed in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Thank you, dear God, for your unfailing love. Thank you, Father, for your mercies, which are new every morning. Thank you, dear Father, for your faithfulness. For even when we are faithless, you remain faithful because you cannot deny who you are. Thank you, dear Father, for your unconditional love. Tune our hearts and minds heavenwards even now as we worship you in spirit and in truth and in the beauty of holiness we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jeff is on. Jeff is on. Last evening I was listening to the camp meeting choir rehearse and I tell you you're in for a treat today. Um, I, before they sing, I want to introduce to you the new pastors uh, who are in our conference. We have about 13 new pastors since last camp meeting, and uh, we, we did this last weekend. Many of you are here today. You weren't here last weekend, so Pastor Jerry Pazikatan and Lloyd Minster and Bonneville, let's, uh, let's give each one a warm Alberta conference welcome, shall we? All right. Thank you. And then uh, Pastor Isaac Amofa there in Calgary and Drum Heller, let's welcome him. And in Edmonton Central, Jacques Moise. Welcome, Jacques. Calgary, Phil Cannon, Chestermere, Pastor Jesse Annunciation. At College Heights, uh, Victor Kononenko. 
And as I, as I mentioned last evening, he will be moving to Calgary to plant a new Ukrainian-Canadian church. And then up in Yellowknife, Courage Nyati. Let's welcome Courage. And then uh, the most recent pastor to show up, he just showed up two days ago here, Pastor Elmer Manzanares in Lacombe and Bentley. There in Pinoca and Rimby, Pastor Wesley Zamko. And at the Garden Road Church in Calgary, Pastor Kamoy Williams. Welcome, Kamoy. Up in the Peace River and Fairview District, Pastor Kevin Warkington. Yes. And then still to come, they will be arriving in September. Uh, two pastors, husband and wife, Orlando and Elizabeth Poulet. Our beloved chaplain at Coralwood, Mark Bullihan. And then associate pastor in the Red Deer District serving the Epic Church, Pastor Donovan Diminitz. And finally, at Calgary Central on the team there, Pastor Leviu Tillahoy. So as you see these new pastors around the camp, please welcome them warmly. Tell them I'm so glad you're a part of the team here in Alberta. God bless you. Day. We need that because you know what? It takes one year for all of us to gather together to worship the Lord in a Sabbath like this. And you don't want to miss it, right? Especially now we are starting. We'll continue the program with three congregational singing and one theme song together. So I invite you, please, instead of chatting or whispering next to someone next to you, just keep it for now for uh, some few minutes and let's sing together. You don't want to miss our songs. We have the orchestra, uh, the strings, and the brass instruments here. Their, their instruments will sing along with us as they play. So now let's sing together, Rejoice, the Lord is King. And if you could please look on the screen, because there are some parts wherein the gentlemen will sing, because it's your time to shine. And then ladies, you'll sing again. And then it's the congregational part again. So please pay attention to... This, the screen in front of you so that we can sing along together. For the first part, Rejoice the Lord is King, everyone will sing together.
Amen. So that means you're ready for the next one. Let's do Majesty. You know that song, right? Majesty. Okay. Let's make it a little grand this time. You know, our God in heaven deserves to be praised. Our majestic God. We are celebrating 50 years of Foothills Camp. Let's sing together. Ca, and then I will ask Pastor Jeff if we can extend the stage up to there. <laughs> if you would like to, <laughs> just tell us ahead of time so we can prepare. Okay? Yeah. So with that, that means we need lots of offerings too. Oh, it's, this is not an offering appeal. Anyhow, we have one more. You know that song, "And Can It Be," right? Let's sing together. Jesus died for all of us, and we have to feel it. You know. The best thing that we can do as a Christian is to feel God's love and to be a blessing to some other people, recognizing that God sent His Son to die for all of us.
Amen. So now, let's feel the Holy Spirit while we sing Create in Me a Clean Heart. Please rise. joy in our hearts because we know that you are our God and with you for you we are going to serve. Bless us fathers we continue with our worship today in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
Happy set. Testing one, two, three, I'm on. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Are you happy in Jesus? Amen. While they're taking a seat, I just want to let you know that last night when the treasurer came up here, he told all of us that we were ahead by $10,000. This morning, he told me, as I came through there, we're behind $10,000. <laughs> if you notice on the bulletin, my name isn't there to collect the money. And then a few, about 15 minutes ago, he called me and he said, we're behind $20,000. <laughs> I don't know why he had to tell people that we were ahead by 10000 we have to realize that this is a 50th anniversary. Could you imagine those individuals when they started Humble Beginning to carve out a place, a sacred space, where people come from around the world could come together and worship shoulder to shoulder. Only eternity will tell the impact that they had in our, all our lives. Now, um, a lot of people on campground would say to me, I'm a beggar, and that is true. I'm not ashamed to beg for Jesus. I've been doing it in Winnipeg, and I've been here 20 years and have been begging. But let me tell you one Sabbath. There's a gentleman who met me at his campsite, and he said, Pastor, you know, I want to make a big donation, but I'm going to surprise you. Bob Holder was our treasurer. And I asked Bob, I said, Bob, how much did he give you? The treasurer wouldn't tell me. But the gentleman told me I gave 100000 Listen. There is no conference anywhere in Canada where the people are more generous than the people in Alberta. Amen. That's a fact. None. And I want us to know, those of us who have just showed up, that this building was built by sweat and labor and the dedication of those pioneers who have gone. They have their sons and their daughters and their grandchildren out in the rural areas. They have given the lifeblood that you and I could enjoy the beauty of this place. My heart always go. Year after year, I would see them come and I would see them go. And I thought, I said, God, if on this 50th anniversary, let us re remember them for what they have done. You see, 20 years ago when I came here, and you go to that washroom, I was on Unit 50, and you go, don't cut me, don't cut me, bro. don't cut me. I ain't start yet, don't cut me. I was in Unit 50, and rain would fall, mosquito will be around. And when you go into the washroom, the mosquitoes will be welcoming you. Come on here. Yeah. <laughs> I got into the shower, and when the water fell on you, it was like ice coming on you. So I didn't know what to do, and an old farmer came to me. He said, Pastor Ali, I have a secret to tell you. He said, let me tell you, if you want to get the hot water at camp, come at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> so I decided to wake up 3.30, and when I came in, those farmers were singing to God be the glory, and they were shaving, and you see steam going up, and all the hot water was done. <laughs> and uh, the farmer who told me to come early, he said to me, don't share it with anybody. And unto this day is the first time I'm confessing it was a farmer who taught me to wake up early and go into that shower. But look from where we were to where we are. Just look at it. I want to tell you this story. My mother died when I was four years old. 
You see me walking around and you hear me making joke and laughing. She died when I was four years old. My grandmother couldn't speak English because her father came from India. So basically, grandmother had was no much help but to cook and clean. My father worked in the oil company. But because my mother died and left five children, she died about 37 years old. Well, everybody thought that my brother and all of us will be vagrants, drunkards. Now, is George around here? Is George around here? Is George? Maybe not. But listen, George was the first individual who attended a meeting and he became a Seventh day Adventist. And after he became an Adventist, I ran away from home and I went to Toronto. And I hid away from God and from church and from Islam. Because we were embedded in Islam. Nothing could touch us. My father threw my brother out of the home because of shifting from Islam to Christianity. It's a no-no. But George didn't care. He decided he going to step out for Jesus. And I ran away from home. And when I landed in Toronto, a little Bible was in my suitcase. I think it was George who put it there. And the preacher that I ran away from four years after in the city of Toronto, he met me face to face. He invited me to come. And I'm here as a testament of evangelism. Evangelism is why I'm here today. Last year I asked you for funds and you gave over 300000 and we went into Calgary with Voice of Prophecy and we, God did a remarkable job. And I want to thank you. I just want to thank you that you gave sacrificially. And so when I got the news from the treasurer that we are behind 20,000, I want everybody, you're singing or you're sitting, to get out your checkbook with social media, whatever you could do. Because I have in my heart a burden for the rural areas in Alberta. I will spend all the rest of my life reaching out to the rural areas, and I'll tell you why. Because you are the people who helped me to be where I am today. And that's all I could give you back, my time and my energy. So I ask at this time, we come together. This is the 50th anniversary of this camp. What you gave last year, you shouldn't. That was 49. But this is our 50th year. And I want to pray that God will help us to go deep into our pockets. And let us give glory to God because a 50 year is a year of jubilee. When the slaves are released and all those who owe, they would pay back. We'll never have this opportunity in our life for the next 50 years. But today is our day. Let us pray. Father God, you're such an amazing God. Where some of us have been to where we are today is only because of your grace and your mercies. May you touch us, O oh God. And may we realize that whatever we give to you, God, is for your cause. For our sons and our daughters as they come move forward. Bless every giver. And I want to thank you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I'd like to invite you to stand together with me as we read the Word of God to, together. I will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapters 15, verses 17 to 22. And it says, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. I invite you at this time to take whatever posture of prayer that's suitable for you. And let's have some quality time with God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for 50 years. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for waking us up this morning. Lord, I strongly believe that there is a father in here. There's a mother there's a couple, there's a child who's in desperate need of you. Lord, remove everything out of the way and help us to come closer to you. Lord, fill this campground with the Holy Spirit. Lord, because we know it only takes a minority with conviction to change the majority. Lord, give us conviction. Give us conviction to preach the gospel without fear. Give us conviction to teach, to live the gospel in spite of fear. Lord, help us to be walking billboards for your kingdom. I pray that you would mend every broken heart in this building. Lord, I pray that you would touch every life that needs healing. Lord, I pray that you would comfort all those who mourn and bless every single person in this building, on this campground that's watching virtually. Bless them, Lord. And Lord, we lift up your speaker, Pastor Millet. Speak. For him, speak through him, and speak to him as well. Lord, we ask that after we have dived deep into this word, that we would feel a little bit closer to you. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. We pray all of these things in the covenant name of Jesus. We pray all of these things in the matchless name of Jesus. We love you, Father. Come back soon. If you're excited about the second coming of Jesus, I invite you to say amen. 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 Last evening, I introduced to you Pastor Cyril Millett. He is the secretary of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada, has served the church for over 40 years. And Cyril, we thank you, 30 years in Canada, 10 years in Bermuda, and now back here. And uh, some of you wonder, well, what, what does the secretary of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada do? Do you ever have people ask you that? Yes. Yes. Uh, the secretary, whether it be of the union or the conference, uh, is the custodian of the, all the actions that are taken, the voted actions, and following through on those actions. The secretary of the, of the union, the conference, is responsible for seeing 
that our institutions follow North American Division policy. Mm -hmm. You may never have seen the policy book, but it's that thick. And so at night you go to bed and you read your Bibles. At night when he goes to bed, he reads NAD policy, something like that. But, uh, but the great responsibility of seeing that the church operates in accordance with the policies of the Seventh-day Adventist Church right. here in Canada rests on this man. And he is well organized, I will tell you that. I have seen his organization skills at work. Three weeks ago, all of the pastors in Canada gathered at Berman University, and the main person who was responsible for all the logistics was this man right here. We thank you for that. I have to tell you that um, when he was in seminary, uh, he was a single man. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of his friends in Toronto invited him up to Toronto for a, a few days and, and arranged for he and several other seminarians to stay with a beautiful woman by the name of Glenda. And so uh, they stayed with Glenda, and I don't know what happened there that weekend, Cyril. Yeah. But uh, they're married today, Amen. and uh, we're just, just grateful for the way that God guides. Brother, our theme this weekend is not by might, mm -hmm. nor by power. That's right. But by my spirit. Yes. And may God's spirit fall heavily upon you as you share God's word today. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, the, Pastor Jeff, thank you for those warm words of introduction. And... Uh, Thank you for mentioning my wife. Uh, oh, thank you. That's all I need is permission. It's always wonderful to tell a good love story, right? Yes, indeed. Um, I visited with my wife, and uh, absolutely nothing happened. There were no sparks. Pastor Jeff, like you, I think, as we told our stories, or I listened to your story, um, in part because of my wife's good cooking. Uh, four or five months later, while visiting during the Christmas break, um, to see another young lady who spurned my affections. Uh, yes, before the end of the Christmas break, my stomach was well satisfied, and my heart was beating a little bit faster because of Glenda Francis. So we are glad to be here with you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for having us. It is a joy to be with God's people. It is a joy to worship and to share from God's Word. As we have journeyed through just a portion of this week with you, it has been a delight to listen to some of the messages, uh, some of the seminars, the early morning devotion uh, times together, it has truly been rich. And I can say that uh, over the last 50 years, even though I had, this is my first camp meeting in Alberta, over the last 50 years, I can tell uh, that this conference, uh, the members and gathering of this conference in this fashion, uh, you continue to walk with the Lord and to move from strength to strength by God's grace. This morning, as we share from God's Word, we recognize that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. I read a little of your history and how 50 years ago, uh, there were some preachers here, and I looked through the list of preachers, and I didn't know a single person save one. A and that name is probably known to many of us, uh, that of uh, Dr. E.E. E. Cleveland. And I said to myself, truly, I am not worthy. Truly, I am not worthy. If you have never listened to E.E. E. Cleveland's messages, I invite you to go online and, and listen. You cannot help but be moved and drawn closer to the Savior. God is truly good. And he allows us day by day to walk with him. 
I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And while we will move around the scriptures uh, today, I want to encourage you to just keep your finger in this chapter. Ezekiel chapter 37. I will read the first five verses. And from there, we will continue. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them around about. And behold, there were very many about. Behold. There were many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto you, unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. Father in heaven, take this lump of clay, smash it down, and then, Father, as you build it up, I pray that your word will be heard from this earthen vessel. And Lord, I pray that as your word goes forth, someone within the sound of my voice will hear your voice and be drawn to the Savior. Have your way, Father, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. talk about a love story, and uh, when I w was in my early 20s and had been at school for a number of years, college, and then on to seminary, most of those years, in fact, all of those years, were spent fending for myself, and a large portion of, those, of that time was spent cooking for myself. And as a student uh, 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 who, even though I had some inkling of how to cook, uh, would just barely manage to make meals. I was, at that time, what some would say a walking bag of bones. I was the skinniest thing around. The, the, you ain't seen nothing yet, preacher. Back in the day, when I was under 150 pounds, they used to call me Skinny Minnie. I was so emaciated. I remember in high school, they would tease me, you're simply too bony. You're just a walking skeleton. All through my youth, they, they laughed at me and, and they said, to me, you need to put some fat on those bones. And as hard as my mother tried, it seemed to get nowhere. And as the others around me teased me, even into my high school years, what stuck in my head was uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I remember one day in the biology lab, there was a skeleton to one side, and, and as a young lady was walking by the skeleton, somehow, I, I don't know how it happened, uh, but she tripped, and in reaching out to grab, she grabbed the skeleton. <laughs> and the skeleton ended up in 306 parts all around her. And sh there she was in the midst of dry bones. Ezekiel 
finds himself sitting in the midst of dry bones. Carried by the Spirit of the Lord in vision, he is sitting in the midst of nothing but bones, a valley of dry bones. I looked for a picture, and, and I could only imagine Ezekiel being in the valley of death, dry bones, as far as the eye could see. But the Lord ain't finished with him yet. The Lord in the Spirit lifts him up and circles him around the valley. And as he goes around the valley, all in every area, in every corner, there is nothing but dry bones. In fact, he could see nothing but bleach white bones surrounded by bones. And as the Lord speaks to his servant, he says in verse 3, Son of man, you've seen all of this. You've seen bones to the east and bones to the west, to the north and to the south. You've seen bones in every direction. What say ye? Can these bones live? How did these bones come to be? Who were these bones and, and, what, and who did they represent? Ezekiel is there. And, and as Ezekiel has all kinds of questions in his mind, Ezekiel simply says to the Lord in all of his humility, God, I don't know. I don't know if these bones can live. Lord, you know. And God says to him, I want you to prophesy over these bones. In other words, that this word prophesy in the Hebrew can be translated preach. So in some of your Bibles, if you're reading a different version, if you're scrolling through the scriptures on your tablet or on your phone, you may see the word preach or speak to the bones. Preach to the bones, he says, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord has to say to these dry bones. I will lay sinew upon you, and I will cover you with skin, and as the Lord speaks to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is wondering, what is happening? Who are these dry bones? And, and, and what people are they? Uh, you know, if, if you were living 50 years ago and you were seeing pictures of people's bones stacked high. And they were saying to you that, that these pictures had come from Europe. You would be saying and thinking of the Holocaust and all of the people, the Jewish people and others and other groups of people, the Roma and others who had gone through the gas chambers whose bones were, were just left out to be bleached by the sun. And perhaps you would wonder, as I have wondered, who are these people? Uh, what were they doing? Where, were they farmers? Were they goldsmiths? Did they work in businesses? Were they in the towns or the cities? Who are these people? Ezekiel was probably wondering the same thing. Who are they? And then if you jump down to verse 11, you get the answer to that question. 
God says to Ezekiel, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off. Verse 11 indicates that, that these bones are, are in the context of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, that the children of Israel, uh, the children who had been in Jerusalem, were now taken captive and had taken a circuitous route up and around uh, and down again into Babylon. And there uh, they felt lost. They felt as if they were dry bones. There is a sense of helplessness, a sense uh, when it says in verse 11, our bones are dry uh, and our hope is lost. Their hope of, of, of one day returning and being restored is, is beginning to vanish because more and more of them are dying. More and more of them are, are no longer are able to remember Jerusalem and the temple, and the worship experience that they had, uh, they are now dying. And, and these bones represent the lost of the nation of Israel. We are told that these bones were very dry. Uh, but God is speaking to Ezekiel, and he's not only saying to Ezekiel, I'm talking about bones, I'm actually talking about the hearts and the condition of my people. Too many, too many are lost. Too many feel a sense of hopelessness. When we walk around our communities, when we walk in the big cities, when we walk and, and drive through the rural communities. There is a sense that people are lost and people have a sense of hopelessness. As we look at the people, as, as we examine their lives, just look at the internet, look at people all around you. There is a sense uh, that the Spirit of the Lord is not among us that people are holding on to any glimmer of hope and they're not finding it in Babylon. Some of us, if we examine even the lives of those within our families, we see that among our children, there are those that are bleach white because their spiritual lives are all dried up. Many of them used to run around this campground, if you want to be honest. Many of them ran in and out of your church, and some of us remember telling them to walk softly in the sanctuary. Now, they're not even crossing the door of our churches. Many of our numbers who made professions years ago are no longer with us. Why? Because of some reason that in their heads they believe is more significant than an understanding that Jesus truly loves them. And despite all of the situations and circumstances that they may pass through, God still wants them in his church and in his kingdom. Today, there are too many bleached bones in Babylon. Too many people who once called God by his right name are now gone. People who once called on his name are now warring against the very same God that they once worshipped. Is it because there is a famine in the land? I would say yes. A famine for the warmth of God's word being shared and preached. 
a famine for the simple gospel of Jesus Christ that he loves us no matter what and he refuses to love us any, any less and he simply cannot love us anymore because we are ultimately loved by him. And yet sin has taken possession of so many. Is it because of war? Perhaps. Maybe it's because of war in our church. Maybe it's because we are too busy fighting each other, trying to have a better way of doing church. Arguing and fussing and fighting, sometimes with our lips closed, but nevertheless, saying with our hearts and our actions that my way is better than your way. Maybe it's because of war. Maybe it's because of rumors of war. Because sometimes... We talk about what's happening or not happening, so we think in the conference office or in another church or in somebody else's home, rather than falling on our knees and saying, Lord, I need your help right here, right now. Let your spirit dwell in me. Too often, we have a famine we have wars, and sometimes people are no longer with us, walking with us because of some reason that they fabricated in their own hearts. And, and, and imperceptibly, slowly, one week at a time, they drift from faith. COVID has certainly not helped, but it has brought out the true condition of many of our hearts. Slowly, they've drifted from faith. Slowly, uh, they've gone their own way. Slowly, uh, quietly, we no longer see them. And in our no longer seeing them, we no longer worry about them. Some of them, because they're the ones we used to fight with, and it's okay, we'll just let them go. Some of them we love dearly because we recognize they're members in our own immediate family. If I were to ask how many of us have children or know of a young person who used to and who are no longer, I would imagine most of us would put up our hands. Can these dry bones live? Ezekiel is asked, and Ezekiel says, I don't know. Can these come back? I don't know. That's the truth of the matter. I, I'm not able to discern with my own eye if these can live again. But I know a God. I know a God who is able. We sing about him. He's able. He is able to see us through. But he's not only able to see us through, he is able to call those who are living in the valley of dry bones back to life. But before I go too far, there is also one more class of people who might be considered among those who are dry boned. You see, when we think about dry bones, we, we can think back to and, and, and God breathing into these dry bones that are in this valley. Uh, this word breath harkens our minds back to Genesis chapter 2 
and verse 7 where the Lord God forms man of the dust of the ground and, and breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life and, and man becomes a living soul. This word breath is the same word that is used in Ezekiel 37 uh, where he says in verse 5, I will cause breath to enter into them and they shall live. Job 34, 14. If it were his intention, he would withdraw his spirit and breath, the same word. All mankind would perish together and man would return to the dust. We all have the breath of God in us to give us life. And if God withdraws this breath from our lungs, we will die. We will perish. Because everyone who's born of the flesh is flesh. And we get to breathe air and have life. But know that even our very life, our physical life, is sustained by God. And we can give thanks for that, for the measure of health that we do enjoy. But John 3, 6, the words of Christ are recorded there that those that are born of the Spirit is Spirit. And that is the Spirit of the Lord that wants to take us and make us into the image of Christ, to transform us, to take our hard hearts, our hearts of stone, and, and transform them into hearts of flesh. It is the Spirit who gives life. This flesh is worth nothing. The, work, the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. The breath that God places in us keeps us alive. But let me say this. It is not until we long for God with every breath that we take. It is not until we ask God for His Spirit with every breath that we take uh, that we uh, are still at a distance and are still dry bones. I remember as a youngster swimming at a beach in Bermuda and my brother and one of his friends decided that they were going to jump on me in the water and hold me under. And I tell you, after being under and struggling and struggling to get these two brutes off of me, Finally, with every fiber of my being, I pushed and nothing happened. And, 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 and I was afraid that I was going to die. Now, there's something you should know about salt water drowning and fresh water drowning. If you're in a lake of fresh water and you drown, there is the possibility of resuscitation. If you drown in salt water, you're done. Why? Because the avioli, when the salt water gets in, it draws the blood across the membrane. And so your lungs fill with blood and salt water and you die. That doesn't happen with fresh water. So there's the possibility of expelling the fresh water and then being able to give you chest compressions or resuscitate you in some way. My brother and his friends were holding me down. I was going to die. And then for some reason, they let me go. Saints of the living God, it's not until we want the Spirit of God to be in us, to live in us, to give 
us life as if our lives depended on it, as if we are taking our last breath. It's not until we want God in our lives as much as we want breath that His Spirit can take control. The Spirit gives life. It is the Spirit who gives life. In Luke 11, it says that if those who being evil know to give good gifts to their children, how much more your heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And if you look in Luke 11 and, and, and you, you count the number of times that the word ask is used before this verse, uh, there are at least six times that the word ask is used between verse 9 and verse 13. And if you count the word seek, and you will find, for example, seek and knock, that number goes to 11. The number of times in Scripture Jesus says before he identifies who he's talking about, ask, seek, knock, plead, he's saying, let it be known with your whole being like you want breath, that you want the Holy Spirit, and God the Father will give it. Some of us don't spend enough time in the Word. We don't spend enough time asking God for an outpouring of His Spirit in our lives. Remember Noah? God remembered Noah. God remembered Noah if, if you and I are to recognize that God still loves us and he wants to save us. Think of Noah, his situation on the ark, totally helpless, but God is looking at Noah and God remembers Noah. Had God forgotten Noah? No way. No way had God forgotten Noah. Uh, but, but Noah was in a desperate situation, and the only peace that he had was in knowing that it was God who was holding that ship, that ark, together. God will also remember Babylon. God not only wants to save, but God in his wrath of love will one day destroy Babylon. So as Ezekiel is sitting in this valley uh, in vision of these dry bones, this hopeless situation, he is looking to God to see some miracle take place. And, and, and so God says in verse 6, I will lay sin you upon you and bring up, upon, bring up flesh upon you and cover with skin and put breath in you that you shall live. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded or I preached or I spoke as I was commanded, Ezekiel says, and there was a noise and behold, a shaking and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I, we, and I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, and there was still no breath in them. You see, there is the recognition that, that you can look good. You can be dressed in your Sabbath best. You can have a picture-perfect home and still not have the Spirit of God at work in your heart, in your life, in your home, in your church. And too many of us are dry bones on the inside. May God help each of us to realize our personal 
spiritual condition. We know that we're not in the Word. We know that we get up and go about our business without spending time in the Lord. We know that we don't have family worship. We know that we're not studying God's Word, that, that the Sabbath school lesson, when we get there, we're talking off of the top of our heads about things that we used to do and we are understanding, but we have no fresh experience with the Lord. We know. May God help us to first, before we look at someone else, before we criticize someone else, before we tell someone else, stop criticizing the other person, before, may God help us to recognize our own spiritual condition and plead with Him, ask Him to send His Spirit. May it fall upon us, may it anoint us, may it infuse us, but saints of the living God, this is a day-by-day -day walk with the Savior. And here's the thing. You can't take a negative attitude and just think it out of your head. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit to get in there. All we can do is say, here am I, Lord. Transform me. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, take this stony heart out and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Of myself, I can do nothing. And so, there's Ezekiel, and he's seeing these dry bones covered with flesh. But nothing is happening. Because without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, there is turpidity of conscience, loss of spiritual life. Turbidity. Turpidity. I had to look that one up. It means that there is no energy of conscience. You see, saints, we can't live on yesterday's indwelling. We can't live on yesterday's blessing. Why? There was a famous preacher that was asked that same question. Why is it that I can't live on the spirit's indwelling of yesterday? The, the, the preacher simply said, I can speak for myself. I can't live on yesterday's anointing of the spirit because I leak. I told my wife, um, that I wasn't going to use a balloon because it was too gimmicky, but I wanted to hold it in my pocket so I would remember to, to talk about leaking. But take a balloon and, and, and blow it up and hold it loosely, and slowly the air leaks out. Or if you have a helium-filled balloon and it's filled up, it, it might float up to the to the roof, and some of us have had those float up in, in the church, and for a couple of months, it's up there near the fan, right? Been there, huh? But most of us don't worry about the balloon because we know that the helium will leak out, and eventually it'll come down. Some of us are so busy worrying about the child that let the balloon go that it ended up there and it seems to be distracting. What we need to recognize and allow that to be an illustration to us that if we are not re-energized by the Spirit day by day, we leak and we will come down. God wants us to be filled so that almost 
unknowingly, as we spend time with Him, as we walk in the Spirit, as the Spirit infuses our bones, and like the balloon, a little bit each day, we get bigger and bigger in Christ. And we are filled with the Spirit, like the balloon that's made of rubber. Not because of anything that the balloon has done, but because of the one whose hands the balloon is in, the balloon gets bigger and bigger. You want spiritual fat on your bones? I know I want spiritual fat on my bones, but it took somebody else to feed me because in my own feeding, I was probably getting skinnier and skinnier. But because someone who loved me was feeding me, and each meal was made with love, I took as much in because I was returning the love to the one who was giving it to me. When we recognize that God so, 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 so much, 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 more, 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 more loves us. When we recognize that Jesus went to the cross because of amazing grace, because of his mercy toward us, because of his desire for us to be with him, he loves us so much that he can't and doesn't want to be without us. And so he came to this miserable world. He allowed himself to be stretched on a cross, pulled in every direction, torn and beaten and bruised, that you and I might have the opportunity to say, all to you, Jesus, I surrender, because your love amazes me. Your love amazes me. And if you love me this much, and so much more. If you ask a child, they talk about, was it Buzz Lightyear? To infinity and beyond. Buzz didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't know Jesus. Jesus says, I made infinity. So, you know, when you talk about to infinity and beyond, what you're talking about is me. To Jesus and Jesus alone is our salvation. Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, many who are without spiritual life have their names on the church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They may join the church, or be joined to the church rather, but they are not united with the Lord. May God have mercy upon me. May God have mercy upon us. And may he show us our true condition. But we've got to recognize as Ezekiel says in verse 9, the Lord said to him, Preach unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. Remember, they had clothes, they had muscle, they had sinew, they had everything, that, and they had the appearance of, of a man, the form of godliness, but they were denying the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Ezekiel, under God's unction, uh, calls to the four. In other words, he says, Holy Spirit, I know you are everywhere, but here is where you are needed. And so make a difference in the lives of these who are dry, who are uh, having, the, as I said, the form of God. Make a difference in the lives of those people in Alberta 
Make a difference in the lives of those people across Canada. Make a difference in my church. Make a difference in your church. Make a difference in my home. Make a difference in your home. Make a difference. Lord, please make a difference in my life. And so Ezekiel verse 10 did as he was told. And verse 10 says, The breath came into them, and they lived. When the breath of spiritual life is in the soul, the impartation, the indwelling of the Spirit is really the impartation of the life of Christ. And the Spirit imbues us with the attributes of Christ. So we no longer act and we no longer behave and we no longer carry on and we no longer hurt each other and we have a correct understanding closer and closer to an understanding of the truth that is in Jesus Christ as we grow because his breath is in us and we're growing day by day in the spirit of the Lord. Oh, how wonderful it is. But we've got to get to the place where we realize that we are nothing. That we, we can boast of nothing. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. The love of Jesus will fill the vacuum that is made by the emptying of self. And even a balloon can't really empty itself of air because there's still some air in this balloon. Even the emptying of self is done by the work of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel 37 verse 14 God says, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then ye shall know that I am the Lord, that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. God is just longing to pour out his spirit in these last days. He is longing. But unless we are talking about his love, unless we are sharing the message of righteousness in and through Jesus Christ and Christ alone, unless we plead with him and we ask and ask and ask, ask individually, ask in your homes, ask in your church, don't stop Asking uh, because God, through Jesus Christ's own lips and recorded in the book of John, has told us God longs to give us good gifts, and the best gift of all is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And every good gift comes from the Father. So let's keep asking until God rains down on us and breathes into us, breathes into my dry bones, breathes into your dry bones, his spirit, his breath. And I shall put my spirit in you. But saints of the living God, when Jesus went to Calvary, and we know he went there for you and for me, he went there that we might have his Holy Spirit. 
because he knew that his work in bodily form, our God, the person of Jesus Christ as a man, was limited. And so in that limitation that he imposed upon himself that he might be able to identify with us, He hung on the cross and he died. He died the second death. We are told that when Jesus died, he died the second death. And I often ask myself, why is it that Jesus died the second death? And then it struck me. When we are told that Jesus couldn't see beyond the grave, he had died the second death so that he might actually be in a position that we as sinners will be in if we die. The second death. There is no resurrection from the second death. And so when Jesus looked, he couldn't see beyond the grave. And I asked myself, okay, he couldn't see beyond the grave. Why is it that Jesus couldn't see beyond the grave? Let me ask you this. As I have just said, is there life beyond the second death? He was telling us that if we die the second death, there is nothing beyond it. He couldn't see it. He could, you, you can't see something that isn't there. There is no life beyond the second death. Jesus couldn't see beyond the grave. That's how I know he died the second death. And when Jesus was in the tomb, Friday the sun is setting, and, and, and Satan comes with a legion of his angels, and he posts them around the tomb of Christ. And he says, they've said that in three days he'll be resurrected. I don't know if it's going to happen tonight, tomorrow, or on the third day itself, but I want you guys to stand here to be here and keep him in the grave. And so they stood and they watched along with the legion of Roman soldiers. And as they watched, Satan was kind of worried. And so around 1202, he comes back and he, he says, you guys, Okay, I see you're awake. Has there been anything happening? Has he come out? Your ugliness, nothing has happened. He's still in the grave. We've got this. That's what we say sometimes. We've got this. you got nothing without Jesus and his spirit in your life. We've got this, your ugliness. And so Satan goes away. Early the next morning, it's, it's Sabbath morning. Jews are on their way to temple. Satan comes and, and he goes to the tomb of Christ and, and he asks them again, anything happen? No. Why are you worried? Listen, if he prophesied it was so, it will be so. But I'm going to do everything I can. And I think that if we all work together, but just come and get me if there's a hint of anything. And, and, and so Satan goes away because he's got other issues to deal with. Because he thinks that 
Jesus in the tomb is the end of things. It's the second death. Saturday night, after sunset, he comes back. Nothing. Your ugliness. Trust us, please. Everything is okay. Satan leaves. And then early, Sunday morning. Early Sunday morning. There was a shake and a tremor. And Satan flies as quickly as he can. He gets to the tomb of Christ. And he looks at his minions. And they're staring at him. Jaws drop. And he says to them, what happened? And all they can say is, he came forth. And what happened? This is what he declared. What did he declare? I am the resurrection and the life. God has raised Christ from the dead, the second death, that you and I need never face the second death. Somebody ought to say praise God. Somebody ought to give God some glory. If Christ be not raised, then our faith in a father who is more faithful than us is in vain. We will still be in our sins if Christ be not raised. Those also who have fallen asleep in Christ will simply remain asleep forever. They will perish. They will be, they will, they will be uh, the first fruit, so to speak, of the second death if Christ be not raised. In this life, in this life only, you and I have hope in Christ. But if we don't have hope in Christ, we are miserable. Now you may say, I'm not miserable. All I can say is, if you're walking and living without Christ, if you don't know the benefits of the indwelling spirit, if you're not walking with Jesus daily, if you don't walk in the spirit, all I can say is, just give him a chance. Give him a chance. And all you've got to do is say, Jesus, Take my life and let it be. Amen. Fully consecrated, Lord, to you. The text says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Paul knew when he wrote those words. He knew with certainty that Jesus was resurrected from the grave and that Jesus became the first fruits of all those who sleep. And so it is that when we surrender, when we give, when we allow Christ to control and to direct our lives, when we give our all to him, in Christ, you and I, anyone, because it says all, the text says all who are in Christ shall be made alive. Alive, alive, and Jesus will say to us someday soon, alive forevermore. Jesus loves us. I don't know how to say it with any more eloquence, but allow these feeble lips, allow this soul to say to you, Jesus loves you. And if you don't know Jesus, today, today 
is the day of salvation. Today is the day that the invitation is given to you to come and know Jesus for yourself. So I've, the pastors that are on the front row, I just want you to step forward. Just step forward. These are individuals among many who want to give and are praying as they give themselves to Christ afresh. And I join them, giving themselves to Christ afresh today. These are individuals who are also looking and asking, God, is there someone, someone who needs to accept Christ today? Someone who needs to join the chorus of those who say, I feel like I need a fresh start. Some have drifted from faith. Perhaps you were more or less pulled to come, but know that the pulling was not from your mother or your sister or your cousin or your friend. You were pulled by the Spirit of the Lord. Today, will you give Jesus this opportunity to know and to, to accept you into his family. And so even as this appeal is being made, even as I challenge you just to come to the front, that one of these pastors might just have a word of prayer with you. I just invite you to come. Don't be afraid because everybody else that's sitting around you, they're saying, Jesus, you and I are straight. But if you don't have that, that relationship, that bond with Jesus, if you are looking to have his spirit poured into you, uh, if you are looking to, to have that anointing by his spirit, I invite you to come. Just come to the front. Wherever you may be, just come. Come. May God's Spirit speak to your heart. If He's speaking, if God's Spirit is speaking to your heart, don't push back. Don't resist. Come. Come. Come quickly. Come. Jesus wants you to come. Come to the altar. He's still speaking to hearts. Some hearts are resisting. Some are resisting. If you're not resisting, just bow your head and pray for those who may be pushing back on the Spirit. Just remember them in prayer. Maybe you're praying for your child. Maybe you're praying for someone who isn't in this building. Just bow your head and pray. Allow God's Spirit to work in your life. Maybe you're listening over the airwaves. I don't know if God is speaking to your heart. Make a connection. Come. Jesus is looking to have you come. And allow a prayer to be shared just for you as you accept Jesus afresh. Doesn't matter how young you are. You may be older. And maybe you can't even get out of your seat. You want a pastor to come and have a word of prayer with you. Just raise your hand. All to Jesus. Give your all to Him. Come.
And if you know someone whose faith is at rock bottom, and maybe that someone is you, you know Jesus, but your relationship with him is at a distance, your faith is diminished, you're struggling. You don't even know why you came to camp meeting today. But you've heard the voice of God. You feel like your bones are all dried up and you want a fresh anointing of His Spirit. If you want a fresh anointing of the Spirit of God because your faith is diminished, just stand where you are. Just stand where you are. God bless you. I believe that God is going to pour out His Spirit upon you. I believe that according to God's Word, that He's going to put His Spirit in you. I believe that as He anoints you today and as you walk with Him day by day, He's going to breathe into you not only the breath of physical life, but He's going to breathe into you His Holy Spirit. And just as He breathes into your lungs fresh air every day, He wants to breathe into your life the purest freshest of his spirit and recognize that this invitation these invitations are not simply invitations that I give Because the text tells us that the Lord has spoken it. It is because of God's goodness and His grace that He is able to put His Spirit within, to give us a new spirit, to take away our stony hearts, to bring life back to these dry bones to give us a heart of flesh to give us life in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ let us pray Father in heaven even as the pastors continue to pray for those who have come. Perhaps there are others, Lord, who will quickly and quietly make their way to the front, even as your Spirit continues to speak to their hearts. Have your way, Father. Have your way in our lives. And Lord, I pray that each one of us will be obedient to your will. As you point out in us that which is not like Jesus. As we look to the Savior, as we see his standard and recognize that we can't attain it in our own strength, in our own striving. Father, may your spirit speak to us of the way forward. And as you give us spiritual breath each day, as we ask and call out to you, Lord, fill us. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. 
And I pray that someday, and that day soon, each of us, each of us will breathe the air that comes from your nostrils as we see you face to face, as we fall down and worship the Father. So Lord, we pray that your spirit might give us the spiritual life, the spiritual vigor, the spiritual emotional fortitude that we need to walk with you because your spirit is walking with us. And I pray, Father, that, that this life-giving breath, your spirit, will abide with us. And we thank you for the promise that you will put your breath in us and that we will live and know that you are God. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the witness of Christ. Thank you for your welcoming spirit. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Amen. Indeed, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And we know that it's the spirit of the Lord. We just want to thank God for the powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit's presence through this sermon by Elder Millet. And the next thing that will happen after this service will be our baptism from two to three. And I just want to let you know, there might be some of you who came in here today who didn't have plans to be baptized. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. Many individuals who heard Peter preaching didn't plan to get baptized that day, but the Spirit has touched you, and you hear the Spirit calling you to make a full commitment to Jesus Christ. We have an entire, we have three bodies of water, an entire pool, a lake, and a river. And so if you want to get baptized today, please just meet us at the pool at two o'clock. We have enough pastors here who can engage in the baptism and just allow the Holy Spirit to lead you where he's taken you to, amen? And after our baptism, we have our Pathfinders Parade at 2.45, and then our- And there's the concert again at four o'clock, so you won't want to miss that. Amen. Right and now, we're gonna have our closing song. Amen, amen. God bless you. Let's sing together. Please rise as we sing, lift up the trumpet, and we have this hope medley.
Happy Sabbath, everyone. God bless.